All right, so just to recap, we're going over the objectives for um, uh, international business for uh, global business. Um, and also I mentioned that oftentimes students actually study this subject even as a concentration, uh, whether on, as, from a management or from a, in a finance standpoint um, for investment purposes and also for working in um, multinational companies um, meaning companies that are based out of one country but have large um, enterprises in other countries and also to go back to foreign countries to actually run businesses there whether they're only local or they are multinational um, it's a great export from the U.S. so the question then is why do businesses get into international trade why do nations get into international trade what are some of the barriers to international trade in other words, um, what are some of the ways to prevent business in foreign countries um, or why other countries prevent businesses or limit business in to their countries? Um, why do governments, it almost sounds like the number two, but why do governments and institutions foster world trade? So number two is what is the benefit? What's the upside? Number four is from the governmental standpoint, um, what do they do to enable this, right? So um, there are benefits and then there are ways to enable it. And, and we'll get into the detail of that. Um, what are the international economic communities? Um, most people are familiar with um, the, um, the um, what do you call it, NAFTA or um, the European Economic um, Community, uh, the EU. Um, um, how do companies enter um, global marketplace? So this is more or less a step-by-step -step approach if you were to start a business um, and take it um, internationally. And when you think of something like this, you always want to think about it in terms of risk. Um, and so those of you who look to go into finance, um, the first thing you always think about is risk. And the easiest way to understand that, um, assuming that you've never worked in a large a multinational large corporation or started a business is just think about when you um, take a loan for a car or a house or get a credit card. They always look at your FICA score. They look at how much you make and how much you spend because at the end of the day, they're looking at what is the risk of not getting the money back. And so when you look at going into business, whether domestic or international, you always look at it from the standpoint of what is the risk that it won't work? And if you remember the factors of production from chapter one, um, there was raw material, um, there was labor, there was information, there was capital. And capital, in addition to maybe large machinery or um, assets that you use to be able to generate money, but capital also includes money. So um, capital is one of the things that, I can't think of any business that doesn't require capital to run. And so there's always the question of what is the risk of not getting that capital back, right? So when we look at going into global business, we're going to also look at it in terms of risk. And so we're going to look at what is the least risky way to get into business to the most risky. Um, and then what are the threats and opportunities? Uh, what threats and opportunities exist in the global marketplace? In the back of your mind, um, I know that some students have told me they, they studied this in high school, if you think about what a SWOT analysis is, SWOT, and the SW um, is the strength and weakness and the opportunity and threat, or opportunity and threat, excuse me, the SW is the strength and weakness, the O and the T is the opportunity and threat, the, the, the strength and weakness is internal to the company, the opportunity and threat are external to the company. And so what we're looking at is wh where are the threats that may inhibit the business to be successful and where are the opportunities that may help a business. And, and then as you go further in business, we begin to think of it, especially from an economic standpoint, in terms of industry and markets. And what do I mean by that? Uh, Ford, GM, Chrysler, Mercedes, Toyota, all of these are in the automobile industry. And so which countries are growing that would want uh, that where there would be an opportunity to grow sales for cars. Um, nowadays, 
alternative ve- alternative energy or electric um, vehicles like Tesla are looking at that. Um, which countries are good places to expand it? Um, there are uh, companies like Apple, which um, with the iPhone dominates the U.S. market. They're looking at what you will learn in marketing is called market diversification later in the semester, but the ability to expand sales sales revenues, but by going into other countries. Because again, most people who are from other countries are familiar with the GSM network as opposed to um, the CD, CDMA. So the CDMA is primarily in the US. There's some pockets mm-hmm. in like the Philippines and China, but mostly international um, folks use the GSM network and uh, Google jumped on that immediately. And so the Android operating system is there. So you will see that the largest distrib- the, the, the largest uh, footprint of the GSM of um, operating system for a phone is actually the operating system from Google, which is the Android phone. So if someone were to ask you, if you had to compare um, Android and Apple's iOS, which one had the largest um, presence in the globe, in the world, um, Android. it would be Android by, by oh yeah, a huge, huge, huge margin, right? And that was intentionally done. Um, and we could certainly talk about how Apple pursues business and how Alphabet slash, in this case, Android, part of their business, how they pursue it. And they do it in very different ways. On the surface, they just look like phones, um, companies that are selling um, technology for phones, but it's a lot, it's, they're very, very different in their approach and how they see, how they make money, right? Um, and then what are some of the advantages of multinational firms? And then what's falling off the slide? That's kind of weird. I don't know why it's doing that. Hmm. All right. At the bottom, it says, what are the trends? And the alternative slides are actually very similar. Um, Yeah, I don't know why it's... Anyway, I don't know if you can see it, but on the but on the shadowed area down here says, "What are the trends in the global marketplace?" So that's everything we want to cover. So we're going to go into that, all right? Um, and of course, the textbook is the same, and hopefully, um, you've read the book and you uh, at least done the summary sides, which covers a lot of this stuff almost right away. So let's jump into it. In this case, we're going to use uh, a number of the slides to kind of explain this. Um, so uh, we'll get on to this, and then I'll pull some additional information the way I always do anyway, um, and I've got some questions. So we start off with what is global vision and why is it important? Um, any ideas what, what they mean by global vision? And remember, the perspective is from the U.S. standpoint, and of course, we're a business class, so the global vision of a business is what you're thinking about. So what is a global vision of a business? And then why is it important? Um, Any ideas? Like uh, their products being um, available and uh, enticing to a global market. Okay. For what reason? Uh, for money. Right. At the yeah. end of the day, don't be afraid of saying that yeah. you're you, you, okay. Someone added something in the chat. I think it's like how they choose to promote their business globally. Yeah. So the promotion part of this, um, thank you, Harlan, and thank you, John. So the promotion part of this has to do with one aspect of marketing, and we'll get into that. Like starting next week, we're going to go into finance and uh, accounting the following week, and then after that, we'll go into marketing. But the the promotion of it would be in um, from a marketing standpoint. Um, so the question then is, is there a market for it, which is a marketing question because marketing is responsible for generating customers. Um, the market is a, is, is a broad term for customers and consumers. So, and, and then once you figure that out, your part then that you're bringing up is, well, then how do we promote in those particular markets? Because people are going to eat and consume things very differently from one country to the next. 
right? So if we looked at, say, McDonald's, for instance, um, and, and McDonald's is the, the most well-known uh, franchise restaurant in the world, um, but if you are going to McDonald's in, say, India, it's going to be a lot different than if you go into the U.S., so if you think yep. about McDonald's, what are they primarily known for? When you go to McDonald's, what do most people first think of? Cheeseburger and fries. Cheeseburger and fries. Matter of fact, they make most of their money um, on about four or five different products. And what a lot of people yep. don't know as a side note is that the, the, um, the part of the brain that registers taste, um, um, they have figured out uh, which part is the, the area where you get the most pleasure and they've designed the, the taste of the hamburger and the cheeseburger within that range. But what most people don't know is if you look at five degree separation of taste from a hamburger to a milkshake, they're essentially within five degrees. What I'm saying is really? the taste of a milkshake is not that much different than the taste of a hamburger. In your brain. Now, granted, in the brain. Now, granted, you may add a ton of salt and stuff, and it will essentially skew the taste of the fries and the uh, burger, but they purposely keep it within that range because that's the pleasure spot of the brain, which makes you want to then, of course, keep coming back and eating more and more and more. Wow. But so if you go to a McDonald's, you go grab yourself a burger, some fries, and a drink. What about if I'm, what if I'm in India? Never been to McDonald's in India. <laughs> okay. So Yeah. They probably have something like uh you know, like tikka masala or something like that, or something very popular to right. appeal to that to that audience. All right. Anyone else? Is there anyone in the class like, from India, by the way? I don't know if we yeah. have somebody from India. To add on to what he was saying, I feel like the menu would be different because it, you know, it's culturally different over there like they don't have the same things we have like like he said for example chicken masala or like naan or anything yeah, they, else they, they, I, have. they definitely have naan there's no doubt yeah. about it okay so anything else I'm, I'm just looking at the names and sometimes the the names don't give it away so what what if what if i was uh in kuala lumpur malaysia or a muslim country and I went to McDonald's. What would be different? Um, I'm trying to see if we have anyone in here, but let's see. I went to one in Japan, and it was delicious. <laughs> and, and you can order a beer. It's amazing. So you can get a beer. Christina, yeah. I know you started to – were you going to say something? Hey, yeah, the um, there's some um, – there's actually some McDonald's that sell rice and Spam. It well, depends on like the culture and, and yeah, it depends on the culture and um exactly what they eat and it, uh is popular. That's usually where they what they go for, but they they still try to stick to the main menu. Right. So um for instance if you're in Hawaii and I suspect if you were a member of the Navy, there was a time you may have spent there, you know the bit. spam is very, very popular there. So even still though is. in the US it's not unusual to get that and a few other things. But um, so, he, and and the other one is if you're in France, which kind of plays off of whoever said the beer, because you can mm -hmm. get a glass of wine in uh, McDonald's in France. If you're in India, because of their culture and their faith, they don't particular they don't eat beef. They don't eat meat. Yeah, beef. They don't yeah, eat beef. beef because you because they they the cow is sacred and the cow could literally be your great grandmother. And so they are really good with their vegetarian and veggie type burgers. If you are in Kuala Lumpur or any Muslim country and you get pork. breakfast with um, eggs or waffles or pancakes, you're not going to get a pork sausage because right. they don't they eat don't pork. pork. Uh -huh. yeah, right. No, and so, no bacon, nothing. Right. Not, no, no, no pork bacon. So, so the point I'm making here is that when you look at the vision of your company and you're trying to grow your sales revenue and you're looking to go into another country, um, first, will that particular product export? In other words, is, is it going to be of interest in a foreign country? And if it is, then you've got to figure out, well, how do I 
um, package this product or service or both into that other country so that it's enticing and, and they will um, consume, buy, use the product and service that we're talking about, right? And so when we look at the vision, we're looking at how do we grow the market? How do we grow sales? And how do we do it in a way that, that another country would actually want it, right? So these are questions that um, you would ask as part of your, as a global vision statement. Um, and, and it goes a little bit more or a little bit further than that. So if I were to go, let's see. So I started working on this. So if I were to, where is my, oh, it's behind the, uh, yeah. So if I were to do this, so um, you guys should be able to see the whiteboard, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So I, I created this little, diagram where it's a supply company distribution so the other thing is in addition to me saying i want to take my product and i want to sell it in this foreign country right and generate more sales revenue and more profits at the end of the day it's always about the profits um there may be something else i can do in another country um so um so, uh, some economists actually look at the world in terms of a main, as a manufacturing floor. And what I mean by that is I need raw material, I need a place to manufacture, and I need place or places to distribute my product and service to customers and consumers. And so when they talk about the world being a manufacturing floor, what they're saying is that all of this may operate in one city, one state, one country. But it could also be that parts of the supply chain, meaning from raw material all the way to when the, the customer or consumer gets the product, those different parts can be in different countries, right? Mm -hmm. the, so, so can you think of a, a product or a company that supply may come from one place, manufacturing may be in another place, and distribution may be in another place? Coca-Cola. Can, can you explain it? Uh, so like here, right in Cayman Islands, their cokes are different. Their cokes are manufactured in Puerto Rico, and they're distributed all over the Caribbean. Okay, so 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 can you take even one step before the manufacturing process of Coca Cola? Like what goes um, into Coca Cola? Uh, you got the coca leaf, right? Um, and where caramel. Does, wait, wait, wait. So where does that come from? I would assume South America. All right, so there's a good chance, and I don't know if we have anyone in the class who's from Colombia, but we primarily got- I was um, just about to say Colombia. Yeah, it's so Colombia probably. So the cacao, um, the bean was coming from Colombia. Now, now let's hold on to that point, but remind me to talk about Colombia and cacao, because it talks, it, because we touch, we touch on something we learned in the first chapter on the economic side. So the cacao is coming from Colombia. It's being shipped to Puerto Rico. And, and actually, that's not a very long trip. Not too bad. Yeah. And then um, it's being manufactured. And then if you think about the Caribbean islands, right, um, there's a few that are large, like Dominican Republic. Uh, I'm mm -hmm. talking population-wise. Um, but there are many very small ones. And so if you think about what it costs to to grow the cacao, to put up a manufacturing facility, and then um, and then um, distribute from one place, it doesn't make a lot of sense to do it from a really small country. From an economy of scale standpoint, the cost would be way too high, and the mm -hmm. price would have to be way too high. But to do it in a place like Puerto Rico, which is a uh, um, a, a um, not a protectorate, what do you call it? Anyway, Commonwealth. Say it again. Commonwealth. It's part of the United States, right? And so, and so, in a lot of ways, what goes on there is subsidized by the U.S. Um, and part of what they're producing may even be going from Puerto Rico up even towards Florida. Mm -hmm. So they have the ability to leverage economy of scale. In other words, for every unit they make, they distribute the cost across each unit. So if one can't, if if, if one um, shipment of Coca Cola is a hundred thousand dollars. If you do it from a small country within that country, each can may cost $5. But if you do it in a way where you can sell 100,000 units of Coke, you can then share the cost across each can, 
right? So the unit cost goes down because each can carries part of the cost. As a matter of fact, you can do that on the distribute on the um, production side, and you can do that on the distribution side, right? And so you're looking at that's why you often hear saying, "How quickly can we scale our business?" What they're saying is, "How quickly can we drive our costs down by distributing costs across all the units?" Right? Um, that's a different can. It's a. Uh, it almost looks like a Red Bull can. And it's probably less aluminum. So they cut costs there. Right. And yeah. if we were to go back to McDonald's, they actually use beef from different places. It's actually um, in South America, they get it from Venezuela. So yeah, there's going to be differences as we talked about it earlier. How do we mm -hmm. particularly like it? How much of it do we like? You know, do we have to alter some of the ingredients and things like that? Martin. Hmm. Martin. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask if um, Nike would be an example. Well, let's finish Coke and then let's talk about Nike. So hold on to that point. So from a supply standpoint, I'm getting my beans from um, uh, Colombia. I'm manufacturing and producing the cans of Coke in Puerto Rico and probably using um, um, some type of shipping that goes and it probably goes through a circuitous route from all the countries. And, then distrib and that's the part of the distribution on the other side. Um, the thing I was going to mention about Coke and the supply and the cacao is that from an economic standpoint, a lot of these beans are now coming from outside of Colombia because the uh, local economy grew. So the middle class grew. The, the cost of uh, labor increased multiple times. And so the result of that, and this is going to come back to you, Martin, in a minute, um, the, the, because the cost went up, that unit cost suddenly went up. And so there are new places where cacao is coming from. Um, one of the, between 20 and 30% of cacao now in the world is coming from Ghana, right? So on the Western side of Africa, uh, a new place where it's coming from, because clearly if you're gonna make cacao, which is important to this product, um, you're looking at an, agri an agricultural product you're looking at the soil, you're looking at the weather, you're looking at places that are ideal to actually produce this. So it turns out the Philippines, because if we go back to the four factors of production, right? And we looked at capital, we looked at raw material, we looked at information, but labor, labor, labor in the Philippines is very inexpensive. So compared to Colombia, it's cheaper. And so when you look at what's called the transaction cost, which includes transporting this stuff around the world, Mm -hmm. They have to produce a lot of beans to be able to justify putting all of this product onto a tanker ship and then shipping it around the world. And the last thing I want to bring up about, um, well, it's not Coke, but cacao is also used in something else that people like, right? Chocolate. Yes. Chocolate, right? And so... And then when I and this will be my last point on the the Coca Cola and the cacao, and then we can do the same thing with Nike. But um, if if I were to ask you per capita, meaning per person in a particular area, like in a country in this case, who cons what country consumes the greatest amount of chocolate in the world? The United States. You would think the U.S. right because we're greedy yeah. gluttons and we always get everything supersized. Yeah. It's not, no. the, it's not the it, United is it, States. Is it Europe? I've, I've looked this up before. So what's the answer, Christina? Uh, is it Europe? I forgot. Okay. It was so many so, years so, ago. So Harlan, pick a country. Um, chocolate. Let's see. Who does chocolate? Swiss does Asia? chocolate. Okay. Asia is not a country either. So pick a country in Europe. Anyone? Who's known for chocolate? Switzerland, Switzerland. I think. Well, yeah. well, Switzerland is not a very big country, and we are familiar with Swiss and the Swiss chocolate and things like that, but they're not the largest consumers. Hmm. So Great it would, Britain. It's Great Britain. Yeah. They, yeah. You oh, do that's that. why their teeth look like that. There you go. <laughs> that <laughs> and, the, and the high quantities of black tea. Ah. Uh, but it's England. So so when you think about it, it's very interesting because you what you're responding to, like when you say Switzerland, 
is you're responding to the brand. Just like in the U.S., you might say Hershey's or M&M's mm -hmm. or Mars, right? You're responding to the brand, right? You're not responding to the economic side of it. So when you start a business, it may be the place you least expect. So Martin brought up um, Nike. So um, Martin, can you take us through from supply to distribution on Nike? I think the majority of the supply comes from China. Then it's produced in um, Vietnam. And then uh, most of it is distributed in North America. Or around the world, but a lot yeah. of it. So when you think of supply, what's a supply? Because we know the cacao is what we needed for Coca-Cola. In terms of fiber. Rubber. Say it again, Martin. Fabric. Well, fabric is one thing, yeah. What else? We all we all wear sneakers. What's the thing under the bottom? You need rubber. Rubber? Rubber. Right. Rubber. And so you have to think of what part of the world would because it comes out of a tree. So you're gonna have um, a rubber plant or 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 a tree that actually produces is and then from the fabric, right? Um like um I think thirty percent of cotton comes from Afghanistan. So depends on what fabric you're putting into it. Um, and then you have subcontractors to put different pieces together and then final assembly. And it used to mostly be in China, but China's economy grew, the middle class grew. So remember the cost- Too of much the, money. The cost of, right, it, caught, it was too much. So, so, so China subcontracted out to places like Vietnam, Malaysia, especially Indonesia, right, mm -hmm. where the cost of labor was lower. And remember, I told you from the outset that students from other countries then take jobs back in their home countries, whether with a U.S. multinational or a com company from another country or a company that's locally based. Understanding the process of manufacturing, understanding how U.S. does businesses, um, being bilingual, they can literally go back and take on senior level positions and man and become managers in these particular factories to actually produce product, right? Um, all right, so I think we have an understanding now. It's not just where does my finished product sell, but also how do I produce the product when it comes from different places um, around around the world? Um, and uh, uh, anyway, we'll move on because I can ask a million questions about this stuff. All right, so. The next part, uh, and then the global vision is the, co is the company's uh, opportunity. All right. Um, all right. So the next thing is on the slide was they need to work on Zoom so that you can do the slide and the whiteboard at the same time. So what impact does international trade have on the U.S. economy? Um, and explain the impact of currency devaluation. Okay, so we'll take these one at a time. So if I go back to um, what is the impact on the, um, what does the, what is the impact of international trade on the U.S. economy? Um, can somebody help me with that? So in the textbook, there was actually, um, they made reference to actual numbers um, I started to write some of this. Where is my, there it is. Uh, right. So in three years, business sales through global expansion has grown from 200 billion to 1.4 trillion. That, that's, that's ridiculous. That's a, that's a huge number. That's a huge number. So um, when you look at businesses in different industries, right, because, you know, we've got clothing industry, we have um, electronics, we have, um, agriculture, whether it's food, um, you know, we, we make a, we produce a lot of soy in this country. Um, we also have um, Hollywood, right? Now, granted, where Hollywood used to be the largest producer of movies, it's not any longer. Um, it was Bollywood, and now mm -hmm. China is the largest producer of, of um, movies and things like that. Um, but we also have now um, electronic games and things that you can get over the internet. So the, all these industries have just blown up. And then because um, what the world tries to do, and we'll see this when we talk about 
um, how, one of those questions about how nations are enabling certain businesses, um, consumerism is starting to spread around the world. Uh, and so um, there are countries that never used to buy as much stuff, and now they're buying more. And so it's almost like you're opening up stores around the world, and they're called countries, right? 113 of the U.S. Fortune 500 now get more than half of their profits from outside. I know that when That's I crazy. was in industry, um, it was always a goal of the companies I work for. I mean, I work for IBM. Um, do you know what IBM stands for? International Business Machines. That's right. And so from its very early inception, they recognized the opportunity to, to generate a lot of money because they had a proprietary product in their mainframe and they also had a point of differentiation meaning other people didn't know how to do it um and they had patents and things like that and other countries wanted what the u.s had and there's a lot of really cool scientific and technological things matter of fact we came up with the television set um the color tv was invented in san francisco we don't make them anymore our manufacturing floors were exported in other countries but we created all these really cool things. Um, and let's see, I, I was writing some more stuff and I ran out of time because unfortunately I can't do this the night before because it erases itself. But Starbucks um, has 24,000 um, stores around the world and 66% are outside the US. No kidding. Yeah, as a matter of fact, when Starbucks first moved into China, before they did that, they realized, where are we going to get the coffee beans? And there's going to be a transaction cost to that. So they set up 400 coffee farms in the country of China. Wow. Um, let's see. And their sales went from, oh, and the rest of Starbucks, their sales went from uh, $4.1 billion uh, in 2003 to 21, uh, point three billion, this is 2016, right? That's coffee for you. So most people think, uh, and Chuck Schultz actually did this. Most people think of Italy when they think of coffee, you know, sitting at a cafe, drinking a small espresso, talking to your buddies and whatever your friends, your family, etc. Um, and the last place that Starbucks decided to go to was Italy, because the idea is how do you out Italy, Italy, right? Because it's always going to appear to be less than, right? So sometimes going to another country is a bad idea, even though there's a lot of consumption, because your product isn't necessarily the right product for that particular country. Mm. Um, And then 85% of manufactured goods in the U.S. are exported by 250 countries. So, um, so uh, of of the 250 companies in the U.S. who do manufacturing, 85% um, of their goods are exported. Right. All right. So as far as impact, there's a lot to be made, right? And so clearly, if if the goal is to pursue profits and growth and sales, um, it's working, right? Um, and this isn't just for the U.S., but as I said, let's do it from the perspective of the U.S. to be able to figure out what we're talking about. We can always then pick other countries and talk about those in particular. But but for the for the, the sake of just learning the, the subject, let's just talk about it that way for now. Um, the next one on that slide was explain the impact of currency devaluation. So the question first is, when we say currency, what are we talking about? When we say devaluation, what are we talking about? So can anybody help me with that? Uh, it's the, uh, so like here in Cayman Islands, like the Cayman dollar is a uh, dollar 20 US. So the US dollar is devalued here. Okay, so twenty percent so, more. So the first part of the question is just to make sure we're all in the same place. Is that when we refer to currency, we're talking about um, the the actual physical. Um, um, I don't want to say product, but the actual physical 
in the U.S. It would be the U.S. the old greenback, the USD, the U.S. dollar. And in other countries, they're going to have pesos and um, euros and um, yuans in uh, China, uh, etc. Uh, and so these, this is what we're referring to as currency, because if we're going to come back to this. Um, um, if you look at it historically, currency wasn't always this way. Um, there were other things used as a form of currency, right? And so for, for the sake of the class, we're talking about things like paper dollars and coins that we use, right? Um, but there are other forms of currency. And historically, even in the U.S., we used other things in place of what we think of today um, as, as the, the physical currency that we currently use. We used other things in, in, in place of or as a form of currency. All right, and so the, the, the next thing was, what do we mean by, mean by devaluation? Uh, okay, so John, you were about to explain that. So, yeah, so the uh, the U.S. dollar is $1.20, right, to the Cayman dollar. So it's, the Cayman dollar is 20% more than the U.S. dollar. So okay. the so, U.S. dollar is devalued here. So so a couple of things that, that, and it's actually good that you're there for these two classes because we can you can basically give firsthand what's going on. And I'm sure that because oh, yeah. there are other people in the class who are from other countries that they have similar experiences, especially when they travel. Um, so when you arrived in um, the Caymans um, and you wanted to get some um, tourist items or get some food at a restaurant um, mm -hmm. or take some trips or you know pay for your diving, um, except for um, the use of a credit card, which actually the transaction does um, go through a transaction and we'll talk about that a little later, but um, you couldn't, and, and let me just stop and say, there are several countries in the world that actually prefer the U.S. dollar, and we should talk about that too, um, but, but for the most part, at the airport or at a local bank or before you leave the United States, you're going to exchange the U.S. dollar for the right. local currency that you're going to, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so you, you convert it um, a number of U.S. dollars into uh, Cayman dollars, and when you did that, there's there was a, you know, if you think about money the same way you think about a hamburger, you got to buy, you have to pay for it, right? And mm -hmm. so there's an exchange rate for it, and so when you bought it, um, um, you said that it, it was a dollar twenty for one Cayman dollar, dollar twenty for one Cayman dollar, yeah. Okay, so so we don't know if it's the value um, at that point or not. All we know is that. Um, the the value of a Cayman dollar is a dollar twenty U.S. right, and so mm -hmm. so if you wanted to buy something with U.S. currency there, now I realize they'll probably take the dollar because it's the because it's stable currency, but or you can negotiate. But let's just say it's one for one. You would literally right. have to give them a dollar twenty for that. Right now, where the valuation comes in is, um, so, so can you explain it, or you want me to explain it? Uh you're you're better with words than me. Uh, <laughs> so. So you, you you want you want to uh, let's say that the um, the in the Caymans they produce something um, that's local to the islands, right? Mm -hmm. um, I, you know I don't think it's legal, but let's say it's stingray sandwiches, but <laughs> yeah, <laughs> something. Um, and they want more and more people to eat it, and some company comes up with a way to export it to a lot of the islands and maybe even to countries in South America, Central America, and in North America. Um, in order for them to get more and more people to do it, one way they can do it is to devalue their own currency against the U.S. dollar. Now, mm -hmm. what do I mean by that? If if right now it costs a dollar twenty for one Cayman dollar, and then I go back and now I can get um, a, a one Cayman dollar for one U.S. dollar, I have devalued the, the Cayman dollar. What if I mm -hmm. took it to ninety cents? Who benefits in that case? If it's a dollar twenty USD or one U one Cayman dollar, and then let's say in a month it's now ninety cents USD for one Cayman dollar, who benefits? Uh, Cayman Islands. Why? Uh, because the uh, the conversion rate. Keep going. Why? Well, uh what well, is it like so what? I'm gonna play the so what game. So what? Uh so like yeah, so their GDP is completely driven on 
tourism, right? Because there's nobody. There's I think there's like seventy thousand people on the entire island. There, that, everything that and banking. But yeah, let's and, say and and yeah, the banking. Yeah. Well, okay. they probably make a ton of money on banking now that I think about it. Yeah. Keep going. Yeah. Um, let's so just yeah, like with, it, let's stick with tourism. Why is it a benefit to the Cayman Islands to value their currency? Right. So the more people against, come against the, the U.S. dollar, because remember, we can devalue against the euro, which they probably do because it was a British. Um, it's the British. Yeah. You probably see pictures of the queen everywhere. But, oh, but it's now more of a hop. Came, yeah, but it's it's more of a hop, skip and a jump for the uh, for the American to come here, the Canadian um, to so come we to the Cayman Islands and the European Canadian dollar. We can devalue against the sterling or the British pound. We can devalue Good. against the USD and we can devalue against the euro. Why is that a benefit to the Cayman Islands? Um, I would think it also, you know, drives the economy. But why? But, how? Explain that. But why and how and explain that. Um, Anybody want to help Jen out? Yeah, that's a good question. Anybody want to help out? All right, let's see. Maybe I should start picking people so I can get people's um how about miracle do you have an idea miracle well wouldn't it keep business good why because it's if you devalue something um you can buy more of something right and so oh wait a minute brian said i got a question what do you what do they do with the usd after exchanging all right so Brian, hold on to that question. Um, let's finish this point. John, you're actually there. So, 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 guys, you all know the answer to this question. Think about it this way. What was the all question people, again? Think about it this way. All of a sudden, everything in the Cayman Islands, if you're from the U.S., everything there is on sale. Yeah. You suddenly Buy got more. a discount because – you know, if if you buy X amount of stuff and all of a sudden now it's 30 cents less because they devalued their currency, you can buy more of it. What if it was instead of a dollar twenty to a dollar, it was sixty cents to a dollar? What you're saying Everybody would be here. I get yeah. I get half off or I can buy twice as many. And so oftentimes you will find countries will devalue their currency one way or another. And we can certainly talk about that too, to basically encourage consumption of their products goods and services right mm. that's where they do it and sometimes the opposite what they'll do is strengthen another country's currency it does exactly the same thing same thing yeah so, so what it's saying is that um, if the u.s currency was stronger by two you're still getting half off or you have the ability to buy two for one right so first right. understand what devaluation is and why because you may think the word devalue sounds like an, uh, has a negative connotation. It depends on what you're trying to do with it. So when you right. hear on a news report, the U.S. dollar is strong and everybody feels good about it because they're making a lot of money. Their currency is really strong. They can buy lots of goods and services. Yeah, you, it's true. But from mm -hmm. where? And so when you hear about these arguments about one country and another and saying, and oftentimes it's between U.S. and China, they're like, um, you know, China is manipulating its currency so that um, U.S. consumers are buying more Chinese goods, but China, but Chinese consumption of U.S. goods is lower because the U.S. dollar is too strong. Because flip it the other way around. If the currency of, of another country that you're buying goods from is strong, mm -hmm. the opposite is true. So if, if one month you were buying one-to-one, -one, and now that country's currency is stronger by two, you can only buy half of it. And so therefore you probably won't buy it and you'll go get it from another country or more likely from your own country, which is what a lot of countries want to happen because they'll try to encourage consumption of their own products, goods and services by manipulating the currency up and down, okay? Mm -hmm. So we understand what currency is. It's literally the money we're using to buy stuff with. And we understand what devaluation is because you're reducing the strength or power of that particular um, currency. And we understand the reason why it's being done. Um, now, um, and I'll get to you, Brian, just give me one second. 
So when, when you devalue, the next part is, well, how did you devalue the currency? How did you suddenly make the exchange rate where if you go to the Caymans, you suddenly could get two for one? How did you get it so that it went from $1.20 to $1 USD to 60 um, cents US for $1 um, Cayman dollar, which means I can get twice as many Cayman dollars because it's discounted to half. How, first of all, what creates the value of the currency, right? So that has a lot to do with the attractiveness of where you're going. So for instance, even though Russia is a very big, powerful country, the ruble is not a, a currency. If you go to um, uh, a place where you do exchange of currency, like you go to Wall Street, you go to the airport, you'll be hard pressed to go there and say, I'd like to tr um, turn my ruples in for dollars. They won't take it because yeah. the ruble is a, is, it, it could be strong one day and weak the next day. The problem is there's no consistent, it keeps fluctuating. This is often reason why many other countries will prefer a US dollar because it's a stable currency and it's stable because um, several reasons. Uh, one, um, it's a fluid market, which means things are coming in and out. We're selling lots of things. So we're constantly creating strength in our economy. Our economy typically will grow um, anywhere from 8 to 12% a year in a non-inflationary year. Uh, and, and definitely not in a year that doesn't, isn't coming out of COVID or out of the, the financial crisis of 2008. In a normal year, if you look at the standard and poor's, it will grow eight to 12% and standing and poor's represent some of the largest industries uh, in the United States. That's why people invest in the S&P. So on average, 10% a year. Well, that means that the money going in is actually producing things of value that other people want and that they're paying for. That props up our economy, our GDP, which we talked about in chapter one. Well, to buy it, you need a US dollar, which means a lot of people are coming into the US and exchanging their currency for US dollars, which makes our dollar very strong. Sometimes it actually hurts us because the dollar is so strong that people then don't buy anything from us. But at the very least, it's stable. The other thing is we are surrounded by the two largest oceans in the world and two friendly countries, which we typically are not going to get invaded, right? The third thing is, and it's actually a fact, is because we have still the largest, strongest military in the world, which means that if someone did try to invade us, we'd probably squish them like a bug, right? And so it creates stability in our in our society, stability in our economy, but we also are um, a highly producing country that people are attracted to and buying our goods and services. Um, in addition, they're coming to our country as tourists, for instance, and using that. So this is what props up um, the, the currency and the stability of the currency, right? Um, now, the other question though is how do we devalue and how do we strengthen the currency? Well, it's fairly easy. Um, so for instance, China has $4 trillion of US currency, of greenback currency in a what they call a basket of funds. So imagine you have a basket and you have money and you have 4 trillion of it. And you want um, U.S. Um, citizens to buy more and more because our currency is the dollar. They also have euro currencies and other currencies from around the world. But again, we're taking it from one country. Otherwise, we never get through this class because there's hundreds of countries in the world. But if, we, if they wanted the U.S. citizens to buy more of our goods, they would devalue their currency and therefore we would buy more or they would strengthen the U.S. currency. So if you have... Um, a lot of something, is it rare or is it plentiful? If you have a lot of something, is what? it rare or is it plentiful? Plentiful. Plentiful. And so therefore, if, if let's say um, you're, you're selling um, the most amazing, I love lemon meringue pie. Let's say you're selling the most amazing lemon meringue pie and it's in New York City where on, on any given day, there's between eight and a half and nine million, mil, million people. And under normal circumstances, um, especially in Manhattan, uh, in the area where people work, there's over 22 million people. And that pie requires all of these very special ingredients. So it's rare. Would you sell it for more money or for less money? More money. More money. More money. So it's desirable. It's rare. There's not a lot of it. And so you would um, pay more for it. 
Now, do the same thing with the currency. If I have a little of it, is it stronger or weaker? Especially Lakers. since it's desirable. And I just explained to you why it's desirable. Oh. So if the currency, if there's only a little of the currency, is it um is it worth more or worth less? I think it's weaker. No, I didn't ask you if it was weak. I just told you it's strong. So if, oh. there's, <laughs> if, there's, if there's a little of it, you just told me that your pie costs more money because it's desirable and there's a lot of people who want it. So now we're exchanging the pie for currency. If your currency is desirable and there's a little of it, is it worth Still strong? More? It's strong. But, yeah. But how would I don't I don't I don't see how that equates because if you have a little bit of money for don't forget it's desirable. It's desirable. It's desirable. It won't be because it's like no, no, you, no. You can't you change have... my equation. You can't change my equation. I just argued why our currency is desirable. So because we, I've already explained why it's desirable, and I, all I'm thing I'm doing now is saying there's less of it. Still okay. strong. Right. So therefore, it's worth more. If it's worth more, you will pay more for it. And if you pay more for it, it's stronger. And if it's stronger, that means that you have your currency stronger than the other country, in this case, China. Therefore, we will spend it on buying Chinese goods because we get the discount. We get the deal. The opposite is also true. You probably heard of this thing called printing money. And when we mm. print money, especially if we don't manufacture anything, it's not based on anything. If anything, we have to pay it back because there's a debt for it. So now if we have this desirable currency, but we have a lot of it, a lot of it, the value of that currency goes down. That means it becomes weaker. And who benefits? The U.S. companies do because now country, consumers in a place like China can say, oh, the discounts in the U.S., let's go buy the U.S. good. And so this is why you, you will see every minute of every day that currency valuations are going up and down. But this is also why the U.S. is so attractive, because the, 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 the movement is, is much less. Now, granted, we're in an inflationary period now, but if you go to Venezuela, where there's a thousand percent inflation. So think about it. You got up one day, one month, and you went to get a loaf of bread for a buck. And now it's inflated a thousand times. But your income didn't go up. Okay. Matter of fact, they're hard pressed to find jobs. They're stealing. They're robbing. They're you find Venezuelans in the Dominican Republic. You find them in the all the Caribbean islands. They'll go anywhere to find a buck. This is the problem. Their money is not worth as much, so they can't even buy the loaf of bread anymore because it now costs a thousand percent more than it did the month before. And yeah. this gets to the point of currency stability and also the strength of the currency. And it has a lot to do with the economy of the country. So what we're learning is when you devalue a currency, it could be good to, depending on which country you're talking about and what you're trying to buy, and we can strengthen the currency. We also learned that when there's less of a, an attractive currency, it becomes strong because it's rare and limited. As, and then the opposite is true. Now, the how part, if I want to, if I'm China, I can flood the economy with U.S. dollars. Therefore, there's many, and it will weaken the currency. And mm. I can do just the opposite. So what John wound up doing, and this is getting to the question that Brian brought up, what Brian, what uh, John just did was he went into the Caymans and he bought, um, because that's essentially what you did when you did the exchange, because you paid a fee. They didn't give you straight money for straight money. Oh no, they no. gave you a fee for it. That's only how those businesses stay employed. That's why I said you got to look at money like a product. So yeah. and just like when you get a loan, you bought that money and you had to pay interest. That's the fee. That's the what you paid yeah. for, it, right? So yeah, for uh, bought, two grand, bought, I got sixteen hundred back. So when you bought the Cayman dollar, you pulled U.S. dollars out of the system. You literally strengthened the U.S. dollar when you did that. Well, oh, okay. well, the U.S. does that with um, T bills and municipal federal bonds and things like that, which is set, it's a fancy word for a loan. So when you issue a bond and people say, "Oh, the interest rate's going to be pretty good," or you know whatever, right? Long term, short term, etc. And so people park their money in the U.S. because we're stable, and let's say that they don't have the money to pay, they'll just print it. 
in any case, you get paid back your money on time and, and there's no default of the U.S. economy. We've only been downgraded from AAA bond rating twice recently because of the inflation and during 2008 um, financial crisis. And then eventually we went back up. I think Fitch just recently downgraded us. But we are we have the probably the strongest economy in the world. Um, and so therefore people trust us, even our enemies trust us and they'll park their money. So they'll buy the bond, they'll buy the federal bond, they'll buy the U.S. Treasury. And of course, the U.S. takes that money we learned in Chapter 1 to build the roads, to build the military, to build public universities, et cetera, hospitals, and the, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all that, pay for Amtrak, <laughs> all of this stuff, right? Um, and when they do that, um, in order to get it, they have to convert the Chinese yuan into the U.S. dollar. You cannot show up under the U.S. United States and buy a, a U.S. bond for a foreign current with a foreign currency because we do not transact business in this country on yuans. We transact business on the dollar. So when they um, buy this, they have to buy all these dollars. And when they buy the dollars, they pull dollars out of the system. So they can literally come into the U.S. and buy $100 billion worth of bonds and pull $100 billion worth of U.S. dollars out of the system, which then suddenly strengthens the U.S. dollar. Hmm. And of course, they can do the reverse. They can flood the market with um, greenback dollars because they have four trillion of them in their basket of currencies. That basket of currencies has currencies from all countries all over the world, right? They can certainly do that. So if they were to come into the U.S. and suddenly start buying things, they would pay for it with U.S. dollars, which would then flood the U.S. economy with U.S. dollars, weakening the dollar. And that is doesn't, there, and that doesn't really help China because the last thing you want to do is not be able to sell their goods. Is, is there anybody that still runs on the gold standard or is everything fiat now? We have moved back and forth off the gold standard. There are some countries that still do that. And there are still some countries that are um, counter trade which is a fancy word for barter. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So we have hopefully a better understanding. Oh, and then Brian was saying, I got a question. What do they do with the USD after exchanging? Right. Um, these, these. Uh, well, well, that's a good question. So Brian's saying, so John went to the Caymans, purchased however many, let's say $1,000 worth of um, Cayman dollars, and that exchange company now he could have done you could have done that in the US, you could have done that at your own bank. There's a lot yeah. of different places you could have done it. But let's say you did it in the Caymans. What do they do with it? Well, there's going to be other biz people coming out of the Caymans who need to convert to dollars. And so now they have those dollars. And at worst case, they put it in a bank and it's called revenue, which is and if they do their job well, where their costs are lower than their revenue, that's called profit. And because Caymans known for banking, they probably have um places um that are connected to u.s banks as far as well as other banks from around the world that they're putting into those banks where they're doing other types of business and um um remember if you were to show up in the caymans with a ruble they probably will say we're not interested in your rubles do you have something else like a euro so um because the chance of somebody coming into that exchange place in the Cayman saying, I'd like to convert my Cayman dollars into rubles. First of all, they would love to get rid of them. Um, and the value of that ruble is probably going to be all over the place because the stability of the ruble is not there. Like the, the Brazil is called the, the real, but um, Iran is also called the real and their currencies are all over the place too. So there's less probability that you're going to exchange those currencies, but so, but when but when Brian leaves, let's say he has five hundred dollars worth of Cayman dollars, he'll probably hold on to a couple of just for keepsake. But the rest, he's like, look, I want to change this stuff back to U.S. dollars, and he's going to look at the exchange rate. And what you do is you wait till the exchange rate's in your favor. So I hold on to money sometimes until it does, and then I switch it back. But he may actually get a good deal there because in the Caymans they want you to turn it back over so they can exchange it back, as opposed to coming into the states which they're not going to see as many opportunities to exchange U.S. dollars to Cayman, so they're going to charge you more. So he's probably going to exchange back to dollars there anyway. So now he's got more U.S. product or currency to actually do the exchange rate. So, Brian, hopefully I answered your question. So it can be they're using it as um, revenue profit gain that they put in the bank, but more likely since they're in the business of exchanging and there's a lot of 
because Cayman's is an expensive place to go. So there's a there lot of showing up there with a lot of money to change to Cayman dollars and then from Cayman dollars back to U.S. dollars. You know, so they're going to keep going back and forth with those kind of currencies. And it's probably very limited. Like they'll do pesos, they'll do euros, they'll do yuans, you know, places with strong economies. They, they'll do those kind of transactions. But the the real from Iran, I, I pretty much pro, I can pretty much guarantee you're not going to see an exchange of Cayman dollars to that because um, nobody wants it. It's why some countries, if you ever fly a plane to another country and they say you can't carry more than $10,000 worth of that currency, because they don't want people coming into another country with, for instance, U.S. dollars, because you can cause inflation of and, and wreck their, their local currency, right? It, it's actually a reason why counter trader barter is actually in existence. If you go to Senegal and they grow soy, they've actually created... Um, securities out of soy to exchange on the, the world market because they don't want it to exchange for dollars. But let's say you've got a wealthy person there and they want to buy a Mercedes. Well, I can't buy a Mercedes for $10,000. So they'll actually do an exchange of soy to actually convert so that they can actually, because it's considered um, tradable on, on, on the, on the uh, global market and they can actually trade not only for other goods, but, um, but for other currencies and monies, including their own. Right. <clears throat> All right. Yeah, international is really cool because if you can get into, you can literally. By the way, um, can anybody tell me an international bank? International bank. Uh, yeah. By the Deutsche way, bank? it is a. It is that is an international. Why did you say Deutsche Bank? Uh. Well, because I know uh, my cousin worked for them, and he was in international banking. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, that was cheating. So yeah. I thought you were going to say because Deutsche is, you know, well, it's uh, German, yeah, but German and they're in the US. So yeah. the, the largest number of banks in any city in the world, believe it or not, anyone know? Say that uh, again? Scotia Bank? So, the, no, not the largest bank, but the largest number of banks in oh. a city. Like, what are the, there's actually two cities. Probably Chase. No, no, that's what he said too. Not the bank, the cities. Name oh, the, the cities. Uh, New, New York. York. New York and the second that's Chicago? city. Chicago? Close. That's where the American stock exchange is, but no. Uh, What's the other city? Remember, remember the name of this chapter. So New York City and... San Francisco? No. Okay, so we, we're just not going to consider the fact that this is a course on global business. How about London? Oh, London. Yeah. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. Right. There's there's seven exchange points around the world right. where they exchange yeah. currencies, like the Philippines and the sure, US yeah. and the, the uh, Kuala Lumpur and the Petronas centers and stuff. But that means that there are more banks from all over the world in New York and in London, which means that that's where you see a lot of trade. And those of you who are students and when you become senior citizens can actually work as couriers where they literally it used to be they would put a handcuff on your wrist and a miniature suitcase they would pay for the flight and because students and senior citizens have, have a lot of free time and to, so if you live in new york there's a good chance you can get a free flight to london they'll give you one night stay because they have legal documents that they can't afford to have sent by like federal express or whatever so you know this used to be a big thing back in the day it still exists and most people don't realize it but but Singapore is a big economy. Hong Kong is a big economy. Hong Kong, sure. Um, Frank, Frank um, um, the different big cities in Germany, et cetera. So you find that there's a lot of transaction exchange going on between those places. Um, and the, in, the, the international banking are the commercial banks. So when you think of a commercial bank, right, banks that do business with large corporations and multinational banks, uh, um, businesses, these are international banks. So Deutsche um, Bank is the, the largest bank out of Germany. Their central mm -hmm. bank is called the, um, the Bundesbank, um, the Bundesbank, excuse me. Um, Bundesbank. So um, they handle a lot of business. And if you think about it, when you think of a German product, what, what product, what thing hey, comes baby. to mind? Say that again? If you think about a product from Germany, what comes to mind? From Germany, what product comes to mind? Um, cars. Yes, because who invented the car? Yeah, the BMW. <laughs> Somebody's excited. So who invented the car? 
who invented the car? What I would think it'd be Henry Ford. No, no, he 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 created the supply chain, which he figured out from the meatpacking industry in Chicago. Mercedes, and so Mercedes Jeff, was the first car. No kidding. Yeah, that's it. So <clears throat> they have. Um, if, so if you think about it, more than sixty percent. Matter of fact, I, I should have asked this question: the country that has the largest um, percentage of their profit and revenue from export is Germany. So here yep. you've got a country who makes precision engineering engineered stuff that um, people all over the world want, like their cars, and so and then you've got this massive bank Deutsche. Um, so this makes Deutsche one of the most powerful banks in the world because they're handling all of these transactions because you cannot buy a a, a, a BMW um, in Germany with us dollars it used to be um francs but now of course it's euros you have to do euros, the exchange. Yeah. well guess which bank wants to be um handling it when you're sending you know a thousand bmws into the us deutsche, deutsche wants bank. To that. yeah so that would explain but, and it would also help to understand why they are an international bank because they're handling these large transactions between multiple countries and remember we we talked about it it's not just sell one product from one country to the next it could be supply, manufacturing, and distribution. So for those of you interested in this space, you can make lots of money. The big it's thing is you have to be trusted, right? You, you, the, trust is a big thing in banking, right? They, you can't have a wishy-washy relationship, um, but it could be exciting. Yes, Brian, Citibank is also a commercial bank. Absolutely. Um, all right. <clears throat> Brian, you can do this on the uh, everyone thing too. That's why I'm saying it out loud so everybody can see your question. Um, let's see. Uh, all right, so we already get that. Um, policy of free trade and relationship comparative advantage. So, so first of all, um, can somebody explain to me what absolute advantage and comparative advantage is? Can somebody tell me what absolute advantage is and comparative advantage? Absolute advantage in trade. Um, they have the most of a product. Um, maybe not necessarily the most, but so if you were in Saudi Arabia, you would have an absolute advantage in what? Oil. Oil, right? So it's kind of like location, 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 or right. I have it and you don't. So they are the they are they have the greatest advantage at producing oil they have a right. massive supply they're really good at extracting it from the ground first of all sourcing mm -hmm. it which is called logging then extracting it um and then they may do some refining but as you know if you ever drove through new jersey on a bad day you can smell refinery yes but you can it's uh, that's <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's funny how they call it the garden state but anyway that's another story yeah. but anyway so so they have an absolute advantage at doing that so it's one country has an advantage over another country. Keyword, one country has an advantage over another con country in a particular industry. Okay. Now then what is comparative advantage? Comparative right? advantage. And, and we think about these things in terms of productivity and efficiency. So Saudi Arabia can be highly productive in the most efficient way. Remember we talked about economy of scale, so they drive their costs down, they make lots of revenue, but even more importantly, tons of profits. Right. Right. What about so how and what explain the same thing, but in terms of comparative advantage. So think of the key, the, the root word of comparative. It's compare. So one thing to another. So in one place. I can oh. be more productive and efficient than in another, but not necessarily what I'm doing. Is it the, the thing I do the best at? But if from a comparison standpoint, I'm at my best. Now, that's where it gets complicated in the brain. Uh, like, uh, yeah, give me one like us and oil. They would have a, like they do fracking and stuff like that. Would that be a comparative advantage? Well, we, 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 in some ways we have an absolute because we're really good with the technology. Right. Um, just like we're good at venture capital. We're, we're better than pretty much anyone because we've figured it all out. Mm -hmm. So remember, we could also have a service. So let's look at um, the Virgin Islands. If you so, and I'm pretty sure this is true in the Cayman. But if you travel around the Caribbean islands, um, when the British figured out how to do sugar, and then brought um, and then finance 
um, Africans as slaves into the Americas, including the Caribbean islands, um, one of the things that they produce in the U.S. it was cotton, but in the Caribbean islands they produce sugar. And if you go there, you the see. Sugar cane fields. Sorry. I was going to say the sugar cane fields. And but if but and, and of course they're not there right now, but you still see the remnants of these stone. They look like cones. Because they were that, there's a part of it where they do the heating inside these cones. So the question is, why did they stop? Now, now clearly there was um, there were abolitionists, and then you know slavery was stopped, and companies got in trouble because they were financing slave trade, and they got in trouble, etc., and all this. So slavery stopped, but they still had the they they knew the process, they had the skilled labor, and now the thing they have to do is pay that labor. So they right. could have still continued to produce sugar. So why did they stop? Because they were really good at it, right? And they had the fields and they had the, the apparatus and they had the process down and they had the skill. They didn't have the manpower. They still had the manpower as long as they paid them. Remember the term is comparative advantage. Was there right. something else they could have done um, that maybe um, they they were – Maybe not. They could. They they were not as good at. But if they did it, they could be more productive, and as a result, they can make more money. I guess they made factories. Have you been to what? the Virgin Islands? No, I'm just assuming. To be okay, honest, so, that was a question. So, 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 think, so think about any small Caribbean island. You probably don't typically think of manufacturing, as I explained earlier. You don't have economy of scale. Now, DR has a lot of people, so that's kind of a freakish example because. You got what around 11, 12 million people. That's still not that big compared to others. But so forget about island like that. But most islands, you know, some islands have less than 100,000 people on it. So we're not going to see any heavy manufacturing unless it's automated and, and it's got something that everybody wants and nobody else has. Like in Haiti, all the gold was stolen. But but what else could I'm, that's why I'm picking the Virgin Islands. So what else could they have produced? Because comparatively, they were, could be more productive and efficient in that and create revenue streams and more profit. They could have still made sugar, but they chose to do something else because they Coffee. don't make sugar there anymore. They, they chose to make an alternative product is what you're what saying. Is it? What is it? Coffee. No. Is it, it's no, Coffee problem. South America. It's a, Well, regardless, it's the same problem. I still have to pay the labor. Hmm. Anyone? Rum. <laughs> well, the, 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 we, the, could, the, we could guess all day. I don't, I don't think anybody the knows. D, the DR makes rum too. See, the problem is that you're only stuck on product. You're forgetting services. I guess I guess the land, agriculture, I don't know. No, you're still thinking of products. The service is tourism. Oh, I was going to oh, say tourism. Uh, St. Tourism. John's Beach is one of the top 10 beaches in the world. And so if you oh, think about it, it, if you go to the a, a college in the, the Virgin Islands, Mo a, a lot of them will get degrees in accounting and finance, but many of them will get degrees in, in tourism. And if wow. you think about it, um, whether it's going on an excursion, going on a diving trip, going on a boating trip, going to the restaurant, staying in the hotels, the Airbnbs, the 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 bed and breakfasts, the 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 the, the, the flights, the everything to do with the tourism, they they are in, in comparison, so if you think about it as an individual, so um, Harlan, you and I could type. You can type 100 words a minute. You're really, really good at it. I can type 80 words a minute. In comparison, as an absolute, you'd be better. But I can find lots and lots of typers. But you're really good at the process. You understand it. Someone has to manage it. So it would be better if Harlan hired 10 people who typed it 80 words a minute than Harlan typing 100 words a minute, because you can easily see where the productivity of the business will go up with 10 times 80 words a minute, as opposed to one times 100 words a minute. And that's the real tricky part of comparative advantage. It's not that you couldn't make the sugar, it's that the, the, the cost and ability to scale is limited, but the ability to scale and, and be productive and efficient with it in tourism was much, much better much much better i may have made a nice profit off the sugar 
but I can never scale it off of that tiny little island. But everybody, this like we talked about the, the pie, just like the currency, everybody wants to put their feet into St. John's Beach at least once in their life, right? Yeah. At least sure. once in their life, right? And, and it's true of all the other um, Caribbean islands. Everybody wants to, you know, I want to dive off of, of Cuba, right? I, 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 I've been to several islands down there and I'm a big diver. So everybody wants to touch one of those places. So that's the difference between the two. That's what compared advantages. Um, all right. So something else we need to talk about between this and the export and import, right? So we know that export is what we send out, imports what we bring in. But we didn't talk about balance of trade. What is the balance of trade? Think about simple math. Think about um, adding and subtracting. What is the balance of trade? Um, the equal price if, for one product mm, and transfer of another. No, yeah, you're kind of dancing around a little bit, but yeah, that's what I was gonna say. The the um the imports and exports. Yes. Out in terms of expenses. Keep going. Or, so okay. in terms of the product, and because the next thing I'm gonna say is, um trade surplus and trade deficit and balance of payments because so you're kind of jumping ahead so if i think about it uh, <clears throat> the u.s makes a lot of soy france makes a lot of wine so the mm -hmm. balance of trade is um how much we're sending to one country versus one is sending to ours and as i said from the outset i, I don't want to dance around the world let's just stick from the u.s looking out so is the balance of trade positive or negative and that's based on how many units of product are we sending out compared to how many are sending back now, the way we do the math on this, of course, is how much is it worth? So right. if we send out something that's worth um, $100 million and they send something that's worth uh, $50 million, then we are a positive negative. balance of trade. Oh, that's positive. Because we, we send, and then, oh, so the other way would be negative. Yeah. Okay, exactly. And that, that's what happens a lot of times between the U.S. and China because we talked about the manipulation of currencies. And then uh, trade surplus is that we have more and then trade deficit would be the less. So that's when we're getting more. Um, now, balance of payments. So so John's in the Caymans and we're in the US and John's buying um, 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 uh, $100 million worth of stuff and we're buying $50 million worth of stuff from him. So explain to me the balance of payments. So if I was the Cayman Islands. All right. Well, this one time, let's do it that way. Go ahead. Uh, okay. So if you want to buy $50 million for me, the conversion rate be $1.20 to a no, dollar. No, no, no. Forget about the conversions. We can talk about that separately. Oh, let's okay. Keep it simple. You, I bought $100 million worth of stuff from you, and mm -hmm. you bought $50 million worth of stuff from me. Yeah, I'm positive $50 million. Exactly. So the balance, yeah. balance payments from your perspective, and this is why I say we – don't want to bounce around the world doing this, or we'll really get confused. The balance yeah. of payments on your side is positive, and ours is negative. Right. <clears throat> and so, um, this is always talked about with businesses when they're looking for people to invest. They say, "What is your what is your position in international trade, and what is the position of of uh, the balance of trade and balance of payments?" Right. And there's different kinds of businesses for products, for services, um, and there's factor income also for royalty. Now, here's an interesting thing. Um, we sell a lot of stuff to a lot of countries. And our, our really good trade partners are Canada and Mexico and England. Uh, and, and China. We do, we do a lot, but we're actually normally in the negative because China sells more to us, because as I, because especially when their labor was cheap, because they could make a lot of stuff. They had plenty of people. They got into manufacturing and automation. And now, of course, their economy grew. And they're moving more and more the way Europe moved, that the U.S. moved, and they're moving into the services industry. So they're getting into software and banking and law. And so they're they're subcontracting out into other countries like Malaysia. Someone had brought up Nike before, places like Vietnam and Indonesia, where it's cheaper. Um, but where we, we see a lot of, since the 1970s, a negative balance is because, wait for it, wait for it, John, our military, because yeah. <laughs> after uh, Vietnam and after World War II, 
We put 40,000 troops in South Korea because we still are their military because we're technically at war with North Korea. We put, still? I don't know how many thousands, it's a minimum 40,000, if not more, in Germany. We got, oh, we got more than that in Germany, world. yeah. We got over 96 bases around the world with mm-hmm. U.S. Um, assets, military, you know, where we're spending money left and right in large amounts of money uh, for whatever reason. I'm not here to get into philosophical reasons. I'm just saying this is a fact. We need it. And so we have this um, this, this, this outlay of money where we don't see much of anything coming back to us. And this is where in some um, administrations where they're saying, you want us to pay for it. <laughs> because well. it would actually, and, and again, I'm not going to get into the philosophy of it. I'm just getting into the black and white of it. So sometimes when you see a negative balance of trade, you got to take into consideration some of these. Out- the other one that's really big is of all the countries in the world, we are the ones that are like, save the children, save the forest, save the animal. We put a lot of money out for philanthropic reasons. Yeah. Um, we do it more than most other countries do in the world. We are, I would think so, the biggest that do yeah. something like that. So we- that's actually considered a balance of trade because remember anything produced within the the confines of that country is considered part of their gdp what they that they get so when our military shows up into a foreign country and those soldiers are renting homes eating the food traveling doing whatever they're spending their money on and then then also we have um um missions we have um u.s mission in lots of different countries um we're also hiring a lot of foreign lo- foreign nationals, far- the foreigners, mm-hmm. into those um, bases and into those missions. We spend a lot of money, and that comes out of our taxes. So we spend a lot of money that way, too. So that's also a big chunk of the money that creates a negative balance of trade or of payments when we look at foreign countries. All right. <clears throat> um, we talked about... By the way, when I was talking about the strengthening and weakness of currency, that actually causes the exchange rates to move up and down um, because the current, because the currency is strong, it's weak, it's strong, it's weak, and that actually affects the exchange rate. Um, why do countries devalue? We already said it. What is trade? Said it. Absolute advantage. Said it. Um, what time is it? All right, let's do the attendance picture. <clears throat> so if everybody can show me their beautiful faces and let's see what people I, I can't wait to see what john is sponsoring us with is that a it's, local brand no it's uh they didn't have any red bull they just had prime i think it's like logan paul's drink <laughs> really so, so you brought yeah. contraband from the u.s no no i bought it from the local store here I'm just messing with you. Yeah, wait, yeah. A minute, wait a minute. That, that's an American product? Uh, let's see. Um, I know the the guy is pretty popular in America. Yeah, this is made in Kentucky. So so here's the thing. You have an American product. Where does it say it was distributed from? Like Heineken is distributed out of Greenwich, yeah. Connecticut. Louisville, Kentucky. So that was literally carried over. So if I were there, I would become a distributor in the Caribbean islands for the product, because remember we said supply, manufacture, distribution, and then yeah. I would get all distribution revenues in, in the in the area. Yeah, everything is imported here, man. Like everything. Well, well, it can be, but it can be from an island that's in the area. And then you basically right, yeah. caught in a scale by hitting all the islands. Yeah. <clears throat> right. So what so what do we have here? So I see G- Giselle. Giselle. There you go. Giselle is sponsoring. Are those ear pods or is that a bar of soap? <laughs> the airpods airpods cool and she, 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 rose has got uh, the water i can't remember the brand i know the green color and martin has got is, is that is that hard cider no it's a uh, conditioner oh conditioner and harlan has got it uh, looks like a computer and anthony's got arizona i haven't seen a bottle of arizona in a million years and matthew's got I see no isn't that the gum thing? What do you got, Matthew? And Nicole has got Yeah, it's uh ice cube. Uh, ice cube, there um, you go. Nicole's got that cool hair. Anna's got lotion. 
Miracle has, I don't know what Miracle has. I have cheese doodles. Cheese doodles? Yeah. That looks like the thing you make muffins in. No, look, watch, I'm going to show you. Give me a second. All right, and then what about the yeah. rest of the faces? Where's Brian? Oh, and now I see it. That's Christina. I was saying Miracle had something that looked like the tin that you make muffins. And Ashley, welcome to class, Ashley. Ashley's sponsoring our class with a bottle of water. Anita, where's your face? Daniel, Yami, Christopher, Ryan, Anita, Ambra. Oh, Adriana has her headband. And Anita has, is that lipstick? All right, so let me frame the shot and then we will, hold on, here we go. So yeah, Ashley, we do this every class. This is our way of trying to enjoy ourselves. So mine's is Annie's uh, Cheddar Bunnies. So, okay, get ready everybody on three. Oh, and Christopher has, I don't know what Christopher has. He's got to get this <laughs> can of something. Can we take the picture? <laughs> Those dog treats? I don't know what that is. All right, here we go, one. Two, three, got it. All right, let's Thank see. You. Hold on, let me see if I got it. She's like jonesing for her food. She's like, dude, take the picture. I want to eat this stuff. All right, hold on one minute, one minute, one minute, one minute. No, it's not that. It's just I got twins. That's why I'm taking care of twins right now, my brothers. Oh, really? Yeah, they're newborns. Congratulations to oh, paternal or identical? Paternal or identical? We're fraternal. Okay. All right. Hold on. I'm just grabbing the image. All right. I got the image saved. Perfect. All right. Um, what time is it? Three minutes left. What can I do in three minutes? Free trade. All right. I'll just do this last slide and then we'll do the rest of the chapter in the next class. So yeah. I find this international stuff really interesting. It's very interesting. And there's a lot of yeah. money to be made, especially if you yeah. live in New York, because there's a lot that goes on through our ports. By yeah. the way, you guys know that the most powerful cities in the world exist on ports around the world, with the exception of maybe a place like Atlanta or Switzerland. And Atlanta did theirs with the, the two train lines, which became um, 85 and 75. That's why Hartsfield Airport had to be so big. But the most hmm. powerful cities in the world, all around the world, exist. Port cities, yeah. Um, so if we look at um, free trade, the idea, what is the point, what is the, what is the reason for free trade? And what do we mean when we say free trade? What, what are we trying to eliminate? Um, um, interference from the government. Say again, Harlan? Uh, interference from the government. So interference in, in, in uh, what character, what do you mean when you say interference? Describe what interference means to you. Like, you know, the government doesn't regulate anything and it's mostly just people doing what they want to do. Like okay. really. So, so, okay. So let's, let's just say what it is. It's tariffs and taxes. And so the idea is that if I can eliminate some of the costs for trade between two countries, right, I can open up more uh, opportunity for production, remember supply, manufacturing, distribution, and sale from by my mm -hmm. product, like um, what John is um, drinking right now. And so if you think about North America, NAFTA, North America Free Trade Agreement, we have a, um, a, a, a tariff-free um, um, uh, borders between Canada and the U.S. and Mexico and the U.S., meaning that for the most part, products can then be sold across the borders without additional tariff. Without, because when yeah. you bring a product into the U.S., who do you think pays for the ports, right? So you may have a private business working at like the port of um, uh, in Elizabeth, New Jersey, which is really large, or the ports out in California with the cars coming from Toyota, but the... Um, but the ports themselves have to, you, you have to have federal people there monitoring because you can't have like children stuck inside containers or arms stuck in kind of containers or cars coming in with the wrong regulation, wrong catalytic converter, which Volkswagen got in trouble for doing um, several years ago. Or um, safety glass, cars cannot come into the U.S. without safety glass is the right thing. All of this has to be inspected. 
this costs money. And our federal government, you can work for the federal government in um, the ports for international trade. And then, of course, we have the Coast Guard that are protecting the ports. And then in New York, because we have so many waterways, the police department, which is the largest in the United States here, um, we have all these different types of expenses that has to be paid for. And that comes out of the tariff. In other words, you have to pay a tax if you want to ship a Mercedes into the United States. Right. Mm -hmm. um, uh, well, if you buy a new one, you have to pay a new car tax and then you have to pay the, 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 the tariff to bring it into the country. Here's the secret. If you buy, if you drive your Mercedes or BMW 200 kilometers um, on the Autobahn or wherever, it's considered a used car and you don't have to pay new car tariff. That's why a lot of people will buy clothes, um, like you ladies go buy clothes in a foreign country, put it on and then say, I've already worn it. It's not new. I'm not, I don't, then you don't have to pay the new uh, product ta tax on it. But aside from that, these are tariffs. And so what they do is eliminate it. And what it does is, for especially small countries that um, don't have the finances to grow and expand, this actually takes some of the cost out and they can grow their business more. It opens up markets for the U.S. to sell into. It opens up other countries' ability to sell some really cool products and services back into the U.S. and other countries as well. And that's the whole point, to grow the pie. And remember, we saw that over three years, the U.S., um, um, revenues for trade went from 200 billion to 1.4 trillion. So mm -hmm. it actually does work. And so that's where free trade comes in, right? Um, and so I guess when we start the next class, we'll start off on this, but we'll talk about um, the different areas like why Europe went into the Eurozone, right? So think about it. There was the French franc, the Belgian franc, the, the British sterling, um, the German franc, um, the Swiss franc, um there are all these and, and the spanish peso there are all these currencies right if you look at here's something to keep in mind if you look at europe as a collective as a collective all the countries within the eurozone there are approximately 330 million people if wow. you look at the united states 330 million people now yeah. think of it. if you took one of those countries by themselves they would not have the buying power of the u.s and so part of coming together was to give them a scale where they could actually produce and manufacture and sell things. So economy of scale distribution and be able to produce and manufacture economy of scale and buying supplies, the same as the U.S., to put them on an equal footing. It also meant that like I had a buddy who worked for Cinzano. He was from France, and he would, he would have to travel through Switzerland because of where the roads were. And so every time he had to stop for gas, depending on what the currency was, it was going up and down. And so it was constantly a nightmare because going from one country to the next was either you could afford the supplies or you couldn't afford the supplies because of the variation currency. But by going on the euro, they had one currency. So you didn't have all of this stuff going up and down. So it meant that they could do more with less. Mm -hmm. So think about these kind of things when we come back, when we talk about trade barriers um, and then countries that are now getting into business together like China and Brazil in Russia, and think about um, the BRICS, right? Um, um, uh, Brazil, Russia, uh, India, and China, and now they've invited um, a, a few other countries, including Saudi Arabia. They're trying to create these economic blocks to be able to do trade from, right? All right, so uh, thank you very much. If you have any questions, hang out tight, um, and I'll see you next yeah, time. Yeah, I have to talk to you, um, Professor. Yeah, so All stick right, Professor. Out. So uh, yeah, Ashley, can you hang out? I just want to ask you a couple of questions so so we can move on. All right, right everybody. So everybody See goes. You guys. I'll, I'll see later, you. Bye. Hey, enjoy your your um, honeymoon. Your thank you, sir. Your, uh, I'll see you in a couple of days. Not honeymoon. Your um, what do you call it? What your anniversary? Honeymoon? Anniversary. Yeah, yeah. Sorry. I mean, we got married fucking forever ago, so <laughs> finally got a chance to go. I, you know, I've been in the Navy too long. That's all right, man. Again, All I, right, man. I appreciate your I'll, service, man. Take care. I'll see you soon. All right. Take care. Bye. So um, I'm going to talk to Christina and Ashley, Ambra, Yami, and Martin. Do you have I, I want to go last because my stuff is personal. That's fine. Oh, you don't mind. I'm going to set up the breakout room. I just want to see if Ambra and Christina. All right. Let me set up the break. Oh, first I need to turn off this slide. And then I'll set up the breakout room and I'll put you guys in it. And then I'll go.
Um, I'm going to go Ashley, Christina, because Yami and Ambra aren't saying anything. I don't even know if they're here. All right, so let me set the breakout room, and then I'll stick you guys in there. Um, let me see. One, two, one, two, three, four. I think it's four. Four. I'm going to sign manually, and then create. All right, I'm going to put you guys in rooms, so I'm going to put Ashley in number one. Then I'm going to put Christina in number two. And I'll put Umbra in three. And I'll put Yami in four. All right, I'm going to open it. Ashley, I'm coming to you first. So if you could join your rooms.
Yami, are you there? <laughs> 